The C notes are over the evolution of populations, how populations change, how we can calculate that change, and different mechanisms for changes in populations. Genetic variation is important in a population. This leads to phenotypic variation. Just remember the phenotype is the physical trait that you see. So these frogs in the image, their phenotype would be green and brown colored skin. Having different colors increases the likelihood that some individuals can survive a change in environment or just having different phenotypes in general. So if something occurred where one of those colors was at a disadvantage, at least the frogs with the other color could still survive. Genetic variation is stored in a population's gene pool. Gene pool is definitely a term that you need to know. It is made up of all the alleles in the population. Just to refresh what alleles are, we talked about the phenotype is brown and green. The alleles are going to be the actual versions of the genes. So like big G, little g would be the alleles we could use. Allele frequencies is another term you need to know. Allele frequencies measure genetic variation. So what we can do is we can actually see how common an allele is in a population and this can be calculated for each allele in a gene pool. So to calculate allele frequencies, you need to actually know the alleles. And so we know the alleles, the big Gs and little Gs in this image, and we just need to calculate how many are each. So first off, we can find the big Gs, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven big Gs, which is written right here. And we have one, two, three, four, five little g's, which is right here. That's a total of 12 alleles for this population of frogs that we're looking at. Calculating the actual frequency is just taking a percent. So 7 out of 12 are big G, which becomes 58.3% right here. And 5 out of 12 for little g becomes 41.7%. That is how common the allele is in the population. The reason scientists and biologists calculate allele frequency is because when allele frequency changes from generation to generation, we can actually show that microevolution is happening. If the allele frequency stays the same, then the population's not evolving because that's the same. But let's say something happens where brown frogs become at an advantage and the green frogs start to die off. Our allele frequency is going to start changing and you're going to have a much higher percentage of little g alleles in the population and that can show microevolution. Natural selection acts on a distribution of traits. A great way to think of this would be height. If you took a population of humans and lined them up by height on a football field, you're going to get what we call a normal distribution. And a normal distribution graphs, graphs as a bell-shaped curve, which is what we see right here. And what that means is really, really short people would be here, but there wouldn't be very many of them. Really, really tall people would be here, but there wouldn't be very many. But you would have a lot towards the average or mean. So the highest frequency is near the mean value and frequencies decrease towards each extreme value. We do refer to these end values as the extreme, so you need to be able to use that terminology when talking about these graphs. A population follows a normal distribution when it's not undergoing natural selection. Natural selection can change the distribution of a trait in one of three ways. With these three graphs we're looking at, the normal distribution or the starting distribution is going to be the dashed line. The first type of selection is called directional selection. It favors phenotypes at one extreme. A great example of this is that bacteria have become increasingly drug resistant. So if we look at this graph, we start here with our normal bell-shaped curve. Here we have some really low drug resistance. These bacteria are killed very easily with a small dose of drugs. These bacteria take a medium dose of drugs. These bacteria are really hard to kill. Well, what happens is those drugs start killing off these bacteria. The ones that are able to survive and reproduce are the ones that have high drug resistance. And now you have this whole new population of bacteria that have high drug resistance. That is directional selection because it moved towards the direction of one extreme. The second type of selection is called stabilizing selection, and it favors the intermediate or middle phenotype. An example is these gallflies that lay their eggs on a particular plant. Something that happens to these gallflies is the large ones 
get attacked by woodpeckers, and so their population is going to decrease. The small ones, wasps can actually lay their eggs inside of them and they will die as well. So the, the pheno, extreme phenotypes are going to start decreasing and you're gonna get more with this intermediate phenotype and we call that stabilizing selection. This last one is called disruptive selection and it favors both of the extreme phenotypes. We can also say it selects against the intermediate and it selects for the extreme phenotypes. An example are these birds called buntings. Here's a bunting over here and they have three colors. They have blue, brown, and then this mixture of blue and brown. What happens is Brown buntings and blue buntings find mates really easily, but sadly the mixed blue brown buntings don't attract mates very easily, and so their population numbers decrease while the populations of the extreme phenotypes increase. That is disruptive selection. These next few slides are going to talk about a lot of evolutionary concepts that you need to know how to define and how to recognize. The first one is gene flow. It's the movement of alleles from one population to another. So this picture shows two separate populations, which means they're in a different area of um, beetles. And in this one, a brown colored beetle migrates to a population of green colored beetles. And now these brown alleles are going to enter this population. So the genes are flowing from one population to another. Some keywords to look for would be migrate, movement, and spread. The next concept you need to know is genetic drift. That is the change in allele frequencies due to chance alone. And that's a really big key. It's going to be random. And so when we talked about you know, the Galapagos Islands, there were reasons behind the changes in those animals. The birds that had the stronger beaks were breaking harder shells. That's not random, that's not chance alone. Genetic drift is all accidental. There are two types, the bottleneck and founder effect, which we will talk about in a second. Keywords to know for genetic drift are random, chance, and natural disasters. For me, it was always hard to remember gene flow versus genetic drift, but I think, you know, if you're adrift at sea, that's usually due to an accident. And so that's why what I use to remember for genetic drift is kind of the accidental one, um, the random one. Our first type of genetic drift is the bottleneck effect. This is genetic drift that occurs after an event drastically reduces the size of a population. So this is going to be random. This could definitely be a natural disaster. And what happens is because it randomly will, you know, just kill a random amount that has nothing to do with the strengths of that population, it can change the allele frequency. And so if you look in this bottle here, we have a huge mix of green and red and yellow, but then a, only a few make it into the surviving population and our red allele has completely died out. Keywords to look for are drastic, reduce, or reduction. The second type of genetic drift is called the founder effect. This occurs when a few individuals start a new population in a new location. Keywords can be colonize or island. So in this example, this bird took a couple flowers from this population and now the seeds have started a new population over here. It's really important to notice that with genetic drift, it's not survival of the fittest. It has nothing to do with the better ones surviving because it is random. And so maybe the red ones are actually the ones that have a strength to them or some sort of characteristic that lets them survive, but randomly they just didn't make it into this population. And that can happen with genetic drift. Another way that populations can evolve is just through mutations. So a population can have certain alleles, like this population has orange and blue and green and white alleles, and that's just what they have. But a mutation can occur, and now this red allele can be present. This actually happens and is how a ton of organisms have evolved. In humans, blue eye color actually started as a mutation, and now it is well into our gene pool. New allele combinations can form through genetic recombination. If you'll remember back to meiosis, crossing over creates new combinations of alleles and this can actually change how alleles go through 
the gene pool in a population. The isolation of populations can lead to speciation. We call this reproductive isolation. So that means when organisms are isolated from one, one another and then they can't reproduce with each other. Speciation is a vocab term you need to know. It's the rise of two or more species from one existing species. Or in other words, how new species occur. In this image, you start with some orange flies. The orange flies were given two different types of nectar, yellow and red, and now we have yellow flies and red flies. And it turns out the yellow flies only want to mate with similar looking yellow flies, and the red flies only want to mate with red flies. And that's going to isolate them reproductively since the yellow will no longer be mating with the red. There are several types of reproductive isolation. The first is behavioral isolation. This includes differences in courtship or mating behaviors. So due to different behaviors, certain members of the population might only want to mate with other members. An example of this would be male and female fireflies produce patterns of flashes that attract mates of their own species. And so depending on the pattern of the flash depends on who the fireflies want to mate with. This image shows um, courtship that birds do. If you actually go to YouTube and type in bird of paradise mating dance, you'll see this bird right here who will actually jump around and make these clicking noises to try to woo this female bird. The second type of isolation is known as geographic isolation. This is when physical barriers divide a population. So originally there was a single population of pork fish, but then the formation of the Isthmus of Panama separated these populations, and over time they became genetically different, making the Panamic porkfish and this regular porkfish. The third type of reproductive isolation is called temporal isolation. This has to do with the timing of reproductive periods and how it prevents reproduction. So an example is this eastern spotted skunk over here, it mates in the spring while the western spotted skunk mates in the fall. And that has separated these populations over time. Another great example would be trees and when they pollinate or other plants when they pollinate. This can start separating populations and forming new species. For a long time, biologists thought that evolutionary changes occurred over long periods of time. This idea is known as evolutionary gradualism which is shown over here. Just the idea that it's evolutionary changes very, very slowly happened. And this was actually Darwin's theory as well. What we've actually learned is that a pattern of punctuated equilibrium exists in the fossil record. Punctual e equilibrium shows that episodes of speciation occur suddenly in geologic time. And this is referred to as sudden appearance. And so here where these split off, that is a sudden appearance of a new species. These sudden appearances are followed by long periods of little evolutionary change called stasis. So when there's just no change for a while, that is known as stasis. And this actually makes sense with what we know about why evolution happens. During these sudden changes, these sudden appearances, there must have been something in the environment that led to these species becoming different species, whether it was geographic isolation or genetic drift or something that occurred. One of my favorite things about science is that scientists are constantly learning new stuff and they are revising their theories. And they're okay with that. There's no ego involved. We, you know, use the facts. And so this theory of punctuated equilibrium, we have evidence for it in the fossil record. And so what we've actually been able to do is we've been able to revise Darwin's original idea of gradualism, that species occur through gradual transformations. There's no evidence of that. And so scientists have said, well, that was a great theory, but now we have more information. And we know based on information that punctuated equilibrium is what actually occurred.